Right. Oh. Hello there. This is Five on Twenty News with Frank Powers and Joel Foster coming to you live from our studio in downtown Tucson. It's Friday. It's Friday. You know what that means. Casual Friday. Ooh, Let's get these things. Get what is this? Up, get ah. out of here. I don't know where the camera's get looking right now, but off. it's looking good. Oh, it's looking Woo. right at us. Right oh, where it counts. yes. <sighs> now I'm ready Take to talk about off. some news. You like these chairs? All right. I know I do. I'm trying something different today. All right. All right. Let's get started. So, uh... The Tucson Police Department. Yes, let's talk about them. They're popular around these parts. <laughs> sure. Oh, they love them. The Tucson Police Department released a report yesterday related to an incident involving protesters and police last year during an immigration protest that resulted in two arrests. The Critical Incident Review Board, or CURB, compiled the information from the points of view both the police and protesters. It found one of the officers, Ryan Green, used force that was without justification and out of policy. Another officer, Adrian Guevara, was also investigated and was found to have acted within policy. The protest in question occurred during the day without immigrants last February. About 100 protesters gathered in downtown Tucson near the federal court to rally the immigrant rights. The organization by uh, Lupe, uh, L-U-P-E, Federal Immigration, was uh, taking place in Washington, D.C. at the time. Clashes began when, according to the report, officers attempted to direct the protesters from the street onto the sidewalk. The report states that an officer was assaulted during this attempt, which caused the crowd to stop marching and surrounded the officers. Chief Chris Magnus addressed the report last evening, stating that the department has instituted some changes to help officers to de-escalate confrontations such as protest. The CIRB found that the department of, was uh, deficient when it came to arrest protocols and lacked a clear policy for clearing protests that unlawfully take control of an open roadway. It was also echoed Magnus's words <laughs> as he used force training, tracking, and review have undergone significant changes between February 2017 and November 2017. Magnus said that the police department needs to get better at working together with groups who engage in peaceful protest. The CURB recommended a new team of officers, called them Community Network Team, CNT, that would serve as a link between protesters and police. Magnus said that the, spe the specially trained officers have already been deployed about 15 times since their, since their establishment. They were present during protests when former Trump advisor Steve Bannon came to Tucson last November, which ended up being peaceful. Magnus said that there was uh, partly a result of the CNT team that were taking on crowds on both sides. However, Magnus acknowledged that two officers were found to have acted out of policy and says that the officer's discipline is pending. He didn't discuss the specifics of the disciplinary action, but said it would be available to the public in two weeks. Magnus has been tight-lipped about what the department would, be, uh, would do, but he's reportedly been stockpiling lots of tomatoes, plenty of feathers, and canisters of tar. Ooh. That Magnus, I'm sure he's got that in his weapons cache somewhere. <laughs> he's got something up his sleeve. He sounds like a video game villain. Yeah. He does. Do you remember the, the protest, the, the one in question here? Yeah. yeah. yeah those big, those, remember the, the video of the, the old lady being thrown down the ground? Yeah. That was, yeah, that was, that that was, was part of that whole thing? That was the whole thing, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll tell you, when they talk about Curb, what do they usually say when it comes to Curb? It was, uh, what's Larry David say all the time? <laughs> curb your enthusiasm? Yeah, that's, that's what it was. That was the curb I was thinking of, and that's what they're trying to do. They're certainly curbing a lot of protesters' enthusiasm. Mm. Uh, we'll see how it goes. All right. The Arizona Supreme Court will review a lower court ruling that banned DACA recipients from getting in-state college tuition. The Maricopa Community Colleges District won an initial ruling in 2015 to allow immigrants to get in-state tuition, but it was overturned by the State Appeals Board in June. The appeals board argued that students covered under DACA, which protects undocumented immigrants from deportation if they were brought to the U.S. as children, were not legal citizens, but that each state can decide on additional benefits. However, Arizona law bars public benefits for those without legal status, so the ruling effectively shut out DACA recipients from receiving in-state tuition. The Supreme Court will now take arguments from both sides before delivering the ultimate decision on the issue. By that point, DACA recipients will all have been deported. Yeah. Take your time. Mm. Take your time on those, yeah, uh, those reports. Time. March 5th is when DACA expires. So it's, oh. it's, it's coming. Yeah, it's, 
Yeah. Today was the 16th? Yeah. Oh, man. Time is a Start packing your bags, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I yeah, hope yeah, not. I mean, yeah. we'll see how it all, uh, I guess, comes out in the end there. Yeah. But deadline's ahead of here. Mm -hmm. So uh, Maricopa County Sheriff Paul Penzone said that it's time the U.S. begins to have a conversation about gun ownership after the Florida school shooting on Wednesday that killed 17. In an interview with KTAR, Penzone asked, how can a semi-automatic assault weapon get into the hands of a 19-year-old kid who goes in and destroys 17 families and an entire community? He was referencing uh, Nicholas Cruz, the Florida school shooter who admitted to killing yesterday. Cruz was expelled from uh, the Marjone Sto uh, Stone Douglas High School and was found to have shown signs of mental illness leading up to the shooting. Penzone said that he didn't want to make a statement about constitutional rights regarding guns, but said that the nation's priorities might be in the wrong place. He said, this is not some kind of statement regarding the Second Amendment. It's a statement regarding responsible gun ownership and being a society that cares more about its kids than being inconvenienced. He said that Americans usually take a reactionary stance on gun violence instead of looking to prevent tragedies such as the Florida shooting. Finally, Penzone criticized leaders for not acting on gun ownership and said that they engaged in hypocrisy. He cited the example of bump stocks, which were banned by the city of Phoenix, but not by the state. Penzone said that in the moment, we get traumatized, and in the moment, we get upset, and then time passes and we dismiss it. We fail to act because politics get in the way. Representative Martha McSally corrected. Penzone in a statement clarifying that it's that sweet, sweet NRA cash that really is what gets in the way. And I think that seems to be the repetitive cycle of madness when it go. comes to this topic. I, I like how it's, uh, we have to start having a conversation about it. We probably could have started having a conversation about it maybe uh, 20 school shootings ago. <laughs> sure. Yeah. yeah. How about Sandy yeah. Hook was one of the ones that stuck out and everyone was traumatized. Yeah. And then this one this week was a Wednesday. Yeah. Well, there was a thing in The, in the Guardian today and they had, uh, it was uh, 1,300 mass shootings in 1,600 days or something. Wow. Um, I put the link up on my Twitter. Um, but it was amazing. I mean, there was so many, there was like three last week that I hadn't heard of that involved, you know, five or six people. They, they're just and they don't even they, make they don't headlines make the anymore. They don't even make the news. Yeah, that's how it desensitized as we've come to it. Uh, and it's uh, just, don't normalize this sort of thing, folks. Uh -huh. That's the idea, is that you have to be upset when we're losing the lives of children in schools, uh -huh. and there is a way to talk about it without it, oh, it's not the right time, it's not political right. nonsense. The time to talk about saving lives is every time, any time, now's the time. Mm -hmm. See? The time is now. There you go. Oh. And there's all, there's all this like dancing around it, too. Like, oh, I don't want to say anything about the yeah. Second Amendment. It's just right. so, ooh. You know, it, but it, it's funny because we, we have a president who calls for the shutting down of media companies, and you know that doesn't seem to get the same. No. You know, it's whenever you even touch the Second Amendment, it's just such a third rail. It's, yeah. it's, it's crazy. Well, you don't want the King of England coming in here and pushing you around, do you? You want exactly. the King of England coming in here? <laughs> yeah, right. Right? Come on. King of England. All right, I changed my stance. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Whew, Keith, speaking of killings, this one is inside us all. Over 450 people have been killed by the flu this season, one of the deadliest in Arizona history. Jessica Rigler of the Arizona Department of Health Services said that, said that the number killed is about 200 more than the agency sees during a normal flu season. She says the state recorded over 23,000 flu cases this season, which exceeded the 2009 H1N1 pandemic, better known as the swine flu. You remember that? Riggler said that those 65 and older made up about 30% of the flu cases, while those 18 and younger made up another 25%. She also said officials have noticed a recent rise of a different flu strain, this one known as influenza B. Earlier in the season, influenza A was contracted by patients, but it appears that the B team is taking over. This may result in a second wave of, quote, something going around. According to health officials, influenza B starts with a slight fever and dryness of the throat. As the virus penetrates the red blood cells, the victim becomes dizzy. They begin to experience an itching, a rash. From there, the poison goes to work on the central nervous system, causing severe muscle spasms, followed by the inevitable drooling. At this point, the entire digestive system collapses, accompanied by uncontrolled flatulence, until finally, the poor bastard is reduced to a quivering, wasted piece of jelly. You okay? Hey, we're doing a show here. Uh, yeah. Let's. You, you got the flu? <laughs> no. Surely you can't be serious. Ah, <laughs> uh, I feel fine. Uh, at least this weather's with us, right? <laughs> at least in the studio. Gorgeous. I Gorgeous. shouldn't have been drinking before the show began. Yeah, totally so, something to make me feel better. 
puppies and kittens. The Pima Animal Care Center is waiving fees for all pets at one of three PetSmart stores during National Adoption Weekend. And that's February 16th through the 18th, so it's this weekend and today. The center was able to hold the event through a $2,500 grant through PetSmart Charities. The event runs 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. each day with all fees waived, including for puppies and kittens. All pets come spayed or neutered, so Bob Barker will be happy, Yay. with age-appropriate vaccinations. Vaccinations for pets, not as a mm. hot, hot a topic. A microchip, also very popular these days, mm -hmm. and a free vet visit. Adult dog adoptions will cost just $18 for licensing fees. Over the past three years, PetSmart Charities has provided the PACC to provide off-site adoption locations across the city. Participating PetSmart stores, including locations at Oracle and Wetmore, Irvington and I-19, and the Elkhorn Mall, all locations will hold the event Saturday and Sunday. If you forgot to pick up those flowers on Valentine's Day, this would be a great opportunity to get yourself out of the doghouse. Okay. Brilliant. Joel writes yep, these things. There we go. Joel uh, writes these things. Uh, Look at that one. back around. Well done, sir. Uh, you well need those done, flowers sir. and you get a little puppy, yeah. right? Did you enjoy your VD on Wednesday? Yeah, I did. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it, was, it was good VD. Uh, yeah, I think that's yeah. why I'm so itchy. <laughs> it's a holdover from <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now in national and international news, all right, a bill that would reduce mandatory minimum sentences passed a Senate committee on Thursday despite opposition from Attorney General Jeff Sessions. The bill has bipartisan support and was approved by the same committee during the last Congress, but the bill failed to get a floor vote. The bill would reduce mandatory minimums for nonviolent non repeat drug offenders, eliminates the three-strike mandatory life imprisonment rule, and gives judges the choice to sentence low-level offenders below the 10-year mandatory minimums. Most of these laws were established by the Clinton administration and have been criticized for overloading prisons with nonviolent offenders who aren't being helped by being incarcerated. The bill also creates a new mandatory minimum sentence for crimes involving interstate domestic violence and individuals charged with providing weapons or materials to terrorists and sanctioned countries. So it's replacing nonviolent drug, drug offenders with terrorists and domestic abusers. That's a good thing, right? Democrat Dick Durbin and Republicans Mike Lee and Chuck Grassley co-sponsored the bill. Sessions, who has made it his goal as Attorney General to crack down on drugs, objected to the bill by sending a letter to Grassley. The letter stated that the bill, quote, would reduce sentences for highly dangerous cohorts of criminals, and that passing the bill would be a grave error. However, Grassley responded that Sessions should have, should have stayed in Congress if he wanted to legislate. Sick burn, Chuck. While the bill has bipart bipartisan support, it may get derailed by some conservative members of Congress such as Republican Senator John Cornyn, who voted down the bill in committee. Cornyn said there is a better path for prison reform under the current administration. He says he was told by the Trump administration that it would be, quote, a great path, the greatest path you've ever seen, so great that no one will ever be able to use paths anymore. The best path. That sounds like a good plan, yeah. as usual, right? Well, probably yeah, yeah. the best, best yeah. path's ever I, happened. Best plan, best thing, yeah. biggest, best. Sure. That's how it's going to work these days, right? Yeah, you can't argue it. Just throw a lot of adjectives. It's basically <laughs> mad libs of Congress. We just throw a good <laughs> adjective, adjective, adjective. That's all we need. That's all we need. And you got the best anything, whether it's water, steaks in the mail, an education. Sure. sure. Yeah. We know how those all worked out for that right. guy. Wine, vodka, walls, everything. <laughs> it's all the best, folks. It's all the best. Top shelf. Mm. So uh, the cost of health care in the U.S., let's talk about that. Mm. The cost of health care in the U.S. is estimated to reach $57 trillion That's by 2026. That is a T, okay? <laughs> we ain't saying time out, all right? <laughs> T for trillion. Mm. So according to a study by the Department of Health and Human Services, that's how much it's going to be. Mm. Health spending is expected to increase 5.5% annually until then, one percentage point faster than economic growth projections. This means that health care health, costs will exceed the rate of growth in the U.S., and uh, by 2026, the report predicts that nearly 20% of the U.S. budget will go toward health care as more of those damn baby boomers reach <laughs> old age. All had to get born at once. The HHS said that the price hike was also due to prices for medical goods and services. Prescription drugs are expected to see the fastest growth, with prices rising over 6% each year on average. HHS also predicted that the uninsured rate would rise because of Congress's repeal of the Affordable Care Act's individual mandate, which was eliminated as part of the Republican tax reform bill this past December. 
The report said that over 3 million people would likely go uninsured by 2026. They predict the younger and healthier people will most likely are going to drop coverage after the repeal of the mandate takes place. In response to the report, the Trump administration said that they were pleased to see that the tax bill finally addressed the health care problem, and you're welcome, America. Right. Aren't we all welcome? Problem solved. Yeah, that's welcome it. to the gates of hell as we all just die, basically. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, yeah. we're all going to get there eventually. Yeah. It's speeding up the process. Yeah. So the river more... sticks. Get your tokens ready, because we're going to need them. Repent. Yeah, we ain't all going to heaven. Come on. No one works here anyway. <laughs> All right, and Congress wasn't done sticking it to Jeff Sessions, oh no, because a bipartisan bill was introduced yesterday that would protect individuals who live in states where medical and re recreational marijuana is legal. Democratic Representative Lou Correa and Republican Matt Geitz introduced the Sensible Enforcement of Cannabis Act. The bill is similar to an Obama-era memo that relaxed law enforcement of federal marijuana laws in states where the drug is legal. Sessions reversed the memo last month because... Obama! <laughs> the lawmakers say the bill would protect people from being prosecuted for legal marijuana use in the eight states where recreational use was legalized and the 29 that have legal medical marijuana programs, such as Arizona. They say that Sessions' reversal created, quote, great uncertainty for these states and put citizens in jeopardy for following their state laws. The bill will likely face opposition in the White House because we're more likely to see Trump run a marathon while admitting he's a terrible president than sign a bill based on an idea of Obama's. <laughs> Maybe yeah. they should just say it's someone else's idea. Yeah, like yeah. It was, it was Reagan. Yeah. Reagan, did Reagan this. thought of this, trust me. <laughs> Reagan was all about all the internet, too. So yeah. he says you shouldn't use it as much. Reagan, not as big a fan of Twitter. So you should maybe lay off of that as well. Right, right. All good advice from... Uh, the great, whatever his nickname was, Jelly Bean Gipper? Concierge. The Gipper. Yeah, That's go. right. <laughs> Got to win one for him. <laughs> All right, let's roll some of that thing going because right now there's nothing to read. It just looks like yeah, it's an good. HTML address. Yeah, we can, you can read it off where you can find it. HTTP slash the hill.com slash home run news slash administration. Sl okay. Uh, looks like Donald Trump's proposed a budget for the fiscal year 2019 that would cut millions of dollars from federal education programs designed to help schools improve safety and provide mental health health assistance. The budget proposal was released on Monday by the White House and will reduce the school safety programs by 25 million compared to 2017. Man, mm. timing. Yeah, timing was, was yeah, on that one. impeccable. Cuts <laughs> include pro uh, project prevention grants, which help schools fund conflict resolution programs, prevent bullying, and pay for mental health care. Mm. Timing. Mm. Politico reported that the proposal would also estimate one million from the school emergency response to violence program. That's the School Emergency Response to Violence Program, which provided millions in funding to the school district where the Sandy Hook shooting occurred. The program funds services to help students recover from violent or traumatic events when their learning environment has been disrupted. The news of the cuts comes two days after a school shooting in Florida killed 17 people. The shooter, Nicholas Cruz, who I don't even want to say his name, mm. reportedly suffered from mental health issues. In a speech following the shooting, Trump said that making schools safer was, quote, a top priority. Mm. This was three days after Trump advised Congress to cut funds from school safety programs. The Trump administration defended themselves in a statement claiming that they increased the budget for thoughts and prayers. Got to yeah. have a deep, deep budget sure. for that. They're expensive. They you do know, throw yeah, them yeah. around a lot. <laughs> they do, but so, they're, they're very expensive. G a good prayer, too. You know, well, you want the good, good ones, right? You don't want just well, the phone cheap ones, in. dime a dozen, yeah. coming from China, you yeah. know, all that. It's yeah. different. It's not as much a wish. As much as a Hail Mary in football is kind of a wish, yeah. Hail Mary in real life still doesn't really count for much. No, it yeah. doesn't. Turns out not. All right. So... The Senate rejected a centrist immigration bill introduced by Arizona Senator Jeff Flake yesterday after the president threatened to veto the bill. In a 54 to 45 vote, the Senate was unable to clear the 60 vote hurdle needed to pass the legislation. Whoa. Oh. Immigrants, yeah, look yeah, out. I know. Hang on a oh, second, Lord. buddy. Get that wall. I was going to say, when I was feeling sick before, I felt like I might have needed a co-pilot. I was going to inflate him. <laughs> All right, the bill would allow 1.8 million immigrants brought to the U.S. as children to eventually apply for citizenship. It also included $25 billion for border security and would have prevented the parents of Dreamers from being sponsored for citizenship. A little for both sides, you would think, right? A group of Democrats, including, Demo including Kamala Harris, Tom Udall, and Martin Heinrich, withheld their votes until it was clear that the bill would not pass, then ended up voting against it. 
Udall and Heinrich said they opposed the bill because it provided funding for the big, beautiful border wall. Huh? Gorgeous. The, yeah. Oh, beautiful. The bill was backed by Republicans Susan Collins, Flake, Lindsey Graham, and other Republicans who thought it was the best chance to finally settle the issue of DACA, which expires on March 5th, a couple of weeks. But Trump threatened the veto after claiming that it did not cover all four immigration pillars he had demanded. These pillars include the border wall, getting rid of diversity visa, eliminating China chain migration, and making sure that Americans never have access to authentic Mexican food. No kidding. Well, guess what? Breaking news. Legit. Mm. So Mexico City, from Reuters, a 7.5 magnitude quake oh. shook southern Mexico this evening, moments ago, a prolonged rumble that rocked buildings across the capital of Mexico City. The epicenter was close to the Pacific coast in the southern state of uh, OAXACA, so Oaxaca. Oaxaca, and had a depth of 26.7 miles, mm. according to the U.S. Geological Survey. The area is already reeling from an earthquake that caused widespread damage in September. Oaxaca's Civil Protection Service said no damage has reported so far. In Mexico City, tall buildings swayed for more than a minute as seismic alarms sounded throughout the city, and tremors were felt as far as Guatemala to the south. Television images showed thousands of people in the streets of the city center where crowds had gathered to celebrate the Chinese New Year. Mm. So Again, timing. Timing. So, sorry about the earthquake. We're going to send 1.8 million people back to your country that yeah. have been here for yeah. years. Doing fine, helping our entire economy. But sure. now, yeah. devastation. Yeah. Here you go. Welcome yeah. to it. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. They're building a wall, but there's still a gate that swings this way so we can <laughs> send them on through. <laughs> How awful. Oh, that's sad. Wow. That is sad. Well, nice. let's talk about something that might be a little more positive. Yeah, let's lighten it up. You know what? Let's do it. Because yeah. I think we're talking about science. Science. So, in science news, what you thought you knew about rabbits, or perhaps wabbits, <laughs> is a lie. And the news still loves bad wordplay. A new study throws <laughs> doubt on the most commonly accepted story about how rabbits were domesticated. And as you can imagine, news outlets had an absolute field day with rabbit puns. Rather than try to do real journalistic work here, we at 5 on 20 are not only going to follow our journalistic peers in the funny bunny pun game, but we are going to do it better than anyone else. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, may we present the greatest rabbit pun report ever. Do you want to do it? Sure. Take right. it away. All right, let's uh, get my, I'll my keep pun, count. pun muscles. All right. I'm going to keep count. This isn't another fluff piece. The story about how rabbits were originally domesticated may be a bit of a leap. In the 600s, French monks lent a long ear to Pope Gregory, who allowed fetal rabbits to be eaten at Lent as a carrot rather than a stick to keep people from eating meat. But a new study says that we've been jumping to conclusions. When a scientist asked someone to hop on over to the Vatican for a copy of the official edict, it apparently went down the rabbit hole because it couldn't be found. The story about how the Pope classified fetal rabbits as fish, not meat for Lent, was apparently a little fishy. That's right, we're padding this thing out with fish puns. I'll take it. <laughs> Scientists now think the bunny trail to domestication was a little longer, taking place at various times in various places. But we here at 5 on 20 have a hutch oh. that you won't think rabbits are any less adorable for it. This has been the greatest rabbit pun report ever. We apologize. As we should. Let me mm. tell you, you got one more in you? Um, let's see. Um, um, I. I Nothing? I don't know if I cottontail to that. Oh, amazing. Mm. 10, mm. 10, 10. Right. You've bing, done bing, it. Bing, 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 You've bing, done bing. it. You've done it. All right. So, all right, this was 5 on 20 News. So be sure to like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube account. And don't forget to, don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest mm. Creative Tucson news and content. You can also feel free to get in touch with us at info at creativetucson.org. And make sure to go sign up for our memberships. That's what we're doing here. We need you to come down here to make content, hang out with all the characters around here, including these couple of characters too. So come hang out at Creative Tucson, I believe, where are we located? 1100 South 6th? I Absolutely. We're the KY building. That's you've, right. You know Super it. marketing. The one you've made the KY jelly jokes about all these years. Constantly. Right? Okay, That's it. constantly. Check it out. So it's raining outside. Be mm. careful. Drive mm -hmm. safe. Have fun this weekend. I know I'm going to have fun. Do you have anything coming up for us after this? 
I'm, I'm going to shoot a new Mediocrity tomorrow. Awesome. Yep. So, so some tomorrow, look forward so it should to be up by on, uh, Monday. Monday. Yeah. Some look forward to a Monday yeah. this week in Mediocrity. Joel's doing that. I'm going to attempt to make uh, school shootings funny. Oh, so that should good be, Lord. Should uh, be, is that even possible? That should be, uh, we'll see. We'll see. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely I think see. Our, I think our dry agitation with it is a little entertaining. Yeah. yeah. What's wrong with everyone? <laughs> yeah, so it's difficult out there. Be mm. safe. Take care of each other. Have empathy for mm. others. And uh, make sure to not go too crazy on that Facebook because uh, just like most things, it's a fart in the wind. Start a blog <laughs> instead, okay? So, or start a show. Ah, uh, where at? A little place called Creative Tucson, 1100 South 6th. Come on down. Mm -hmm. Go sign up. Gonna get a membership, creativetucson.org. Yep. Yep. Lots of stuff to do. Go find that assets page down at the bottom of the corner. Best page on the site. <laughs> it is. All right, so again, I'm Frank Powers. Joel, Joel Foster. Foster. There he is. Thanks for hanging out with us. And don't forget, stay creative, Tucson. Woo! Wanna spin in chairs? Yeah. Let's spin yeah. in chairs. Woo! We got chairs. We got chairs. We got